Yeah, it's me. It's your boy. Welcome to Chess, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate you guys very much for stopping by, taking a look at my stuff. For all of my people in the Philippines, maga nang maga, mabuhay, ingat lagi. Uh, kamusta na to you guys? Meraming uh, salamat po sa nana nude. A king makaibigan. Masaya kiri mag... Masaya Kong Makita Kang Muli. Yeah, appreciate it very much. For anybody who's coming from France or who does speak French, bonjour to you. Comment se va? Comment se le va? Ça me fait plaisir de te voir, mes amis. Appreciate you guys very much uh, for stopping by, taking a look at my stuff real quick. So, you guys are checking out. Let me see. I got my shirt here. Uh, so, my aunt bought me this shirt and it just came in the mail today. Uh, so, I thought it was kind of cool. It's so like a little chest piece, uh, like a little wristband thing and stuff, you know. So, it's kind of decorated. So, I appreciate it, Ain't Mish. Um, so yes, if you guys are ready to go, uh, let's take a look and see, uh, double check that we're good. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what we have for this game. Now I got this game. This is Wesley soul versus Maxine Vachey Lagrave. Um, this is taken from round two, game three of the knockout portion of the tournament. Um, I tried to go back and get any games that I hadn't already done. Uh, so this is one of those. So let's roll. All right. So we got D4, E6, Knight comes to F3. We got Knight to F6 and we have C4. As you guys know, that you guys have seen a lot of my videos, you know, a lot of games do start off this way. So I'm always telling you about the transpositions and stuff like that. So we have knight to c6. Uh, so that's a little bit of a newer newer variation we're seeing. So we got g3, uh, bishop comes to b4, we have knight b to d2, and we got d6. So um, we have the Indian game, and it is the East Indian anti Nimzo Indian variation. Now, if we back up just a touch uh, to when we had that initial position, um, if we do go bishop bishop to b4 in this position, we have knight to c3. This is the Nimzo Indian. Um, and so you're pretty much as white inviting a trade here, which is pretty much usually what uh, black does. Uh, and it doesn't really too much damage your structure. Uh, it's not going to leave you with like really crazy weak pawns. So. Uh, but yeah, backing up to what we had, we had d6. So um, knight b to d2, it just kind of avoids that whole situation uh, because there are uh, quite a few uh, players who don't like their damage, their structure being damaged, like for any reason. Um, and I personally try to stay away from it as much as possible if you can. Um, so knight b to d2, it kind of has like a you know a French Tarash type of idea behind it, uh, because you know of course if you have the bishop taken, you can take back with the queen or the bishop or something like that, so you're good to go. So we have a3, um, a3, um, it's it's not the best tempo. Um, so in this position, actually, instead of a3, bishop to g2 is preferred um, because you just pretty much get castled and you start to, you know, develop your pieces. Because like I said, I mean, when the, if the bishop takes here, you're just going to take back with the queen or the bishop. Um, if you did uh, capture here, you'd probably, you know, you could take back with the, uh, with the bishop. It's probably best with the queen, but, you know, after castles by black, we do see rook over to c1. So I imagine you guys can see you're doing pretty well here as white. So uh, that's that's definitely a way to play. Uh, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to, you know, ask the question, ask the bishop a question. Um, but we do see bishop takes d2 here. We got queen taking d2. We got queen over to e7. We have bishop to g2. Uh, and we have e5. And so we have uh, castles by white and we have castles by black. And castles by black is the novelty of the game. And I'll put one more move down. We got b4 as white. Now, there are a few points that I want to hit on. Um, in this particular position, if we just back up just a touch, uh, when we saw a e5, a really, really aggressive and really, really good uh, move to play uh, in this position is actually d5. And d5 asks a real question to the knight because, you know, you don't really have a lot of places you can put it. You definitely don't have anywhere down here you can put it. Um, so you're forced to have to go back to either uh, d8 or b8. Um, usually b8 is going to be more preferred. Uh, because it's easy to develop the knight from there. Uh, so we got castles by white, knight b to d7, b4. Uh, and then if you do see e4 from black, um, you have the ability to move this knight in this really, really beautiful central square. Uh, and then, you know, the bishop is coming. Uh, so you're going to be on this diagonal and stuff like that. So as you can see, white is just doing really, really good. And black kind of has like some congestion going on. So they have a little bit of, of you know, issues they have to kind of iron out. So uh, backing up to what we had um, after e5, we did see castles by white, castles by black, and we see b4. Um, and actually in this position, um, not pushing d5 actually gives uh, black the ability to do their own pawn push, uh, and that is e4. Um, now the problem is you don't have the d4 square to put the knight, uh, so you kind of have to put it in like a really weird spot, uh, g5. You can also go down to e1, 
But I mean, these aren't ideal situations for your knights to have to go literally back to the edge of the board. So um, knight would come to g5, you see rook to e8. And then if you did push g5 in this position, um, you would actually be allowing black to put their knight on e5. Um, and as you guys can see, it's pretty influential. Um, it can come here, it can come here. Uh, you're going to be probably be forced to play queen to c2. Um, so it's just, you know, black is just doing much better in this position than they would have been before. But um, after bishop to b4, um, Maxime vachier Legrave actually misses the opportunity for that uh, and goes bishop to f5. So that allows white to go bishop to b2. And so we have uh, bishop to e4. We have rook f to e1. Uh, we have rook f to e8. And then we see b5 here. Uh, and so we got knight takes d4, knight takes d4, pawn takes d4, uh, and then we throw a little inner mizzo in there with f3. Bishop comes back to g6, and then we take on uh, d4 with the queen. Um, and this allows, you know, the queen to check on e3. So we got a trade of queens going on. Uh, and then the rook takes e3. Um, we have bishop to d4. As you can see, white does have the bishop pair. So, you know, you're trying to maximize your bishop pair as much as possible. Uh, so we see rook over to b3 and we see e4 and i think this is a really like funny position that we've gotten in uh because when you think about it this rook is literally trapped like on the white side of the board so as you can see it doesn't really have anywhere it can move uh to try to like escape and get back like kind of on its own side so i just thought like that's not something you see every day you know like your, your opponent's rook is just kind of trapped in your on your side of the board so it's kind of interesting to see so we got knight over to d7 we have f4 of course, you know, if we're allowed to just continue to push, that's going to be knocking the bishop around. So we got f6, we got e5, pawn takes f, uh, e5, pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, we have bishop takes e5, knight takes e5, and then we have rook takes e5. And uh, we have uh, bishop to f7 in the position. Now, bishop back to f7 actually allows a defensive move as well as an attacking move like simultaneously uh, and that is rook to c5 it was definitely also possible just to go rook to c to, to e7 and that's pretty like fundamental you know just putting that rook on the seventh rank but um you know we see rook to c5 and as you guys can see you know we're attacking this pawn we're attacking this pawn and we're also defending this pawn here so i mean white is doing very very well in this position um something kind of has to give so we see c6 Pawn takes c6, pawn takes c6, and rook takes c6. You kind of had to do it uh, because there literally was no way to protect all of those points um, at once. Um, so we got rook over to d8. We see now rook to c7. So putting that rook on the seventh. We have h5, rook takes a7, and then we see bishop takes c4. But the important thing that you have to note about the position is this outside pass pawn. Now, as you guys probably might be familiar as far as end games are concerned, um, when you have a pass pawn, a pass pawn is almost always good as long as it's protected and you can keep pushing it. Um, but an outside pass pawn, especially getting into like a king and pawn or like rooks or bishop type of end game, an outside pass pawn is preferred because it just is that much harder for the king to try to come over and have anything to say about it. Especially when you have pawns on opposite sides of the board, it's really hard for a king to, you know, deal with that type of an end game. So we see rook to a8. You know, you're up material, so go ahead and try to trade material. So we see rook takes a8, bishop takes a8, uh, and then we see g5. And we have reached a point in the game where if you want to go ahead and pause the video uh, and spot the win for white, go ahead and do so. Okay, cool. So this is like something that you literally hear me talk about all the time. Um, it is the move is actually a4. Now, you guys hear me say, I know I've said like forever amount of times uh, that pass pawns must be pushed. I mean, I'm not the one that came up with that, uh, but that's literally when you have pass pawns, they must be pushed. Now, if you were to hit a4 in this position, um, you might see something like rook to b8. The bishop would come back to g2, and the important things that you have to notice about the situation is this bishop is controlling the queening square, and so is the rook. Um, so this is going to put black in a very, very defensive position. So the bishop would come back to a6. We'd see a5. We got king to f7, bishop to f1. We really, really want to get this bishop out from in front of this pawn. So if you do decline a trade, um, which it really doesn't too much matter what you do in the position, uh, we would see a6. Uh, and, uh, you know, there really isn't much to be done. I mean, you can back this bishop up, but bishop to g2 is going to like, you're going to have to trade. Uh, and uh, there's just really nothing else to get done. The king is going to try to come over this way possibly, but then it's going to have to abandon these pawns. And that's not where you want to be. But back when g5 was played um actually a4 wasn't what was played in the game um so wesley so actually misses this so we see rook to c1 
Um, and unfortunately, this actually just like this just uh, allows a like a complete draw. Um, so basically, uh, what you'll be seeing uh, is rook taking a three, rook taking c4, rook taking a8. And as you guys can see the board, um, this is a completely drawn rook in game. Um, that is not actually what happens in the game. If we go back to what we originally had after g5, we saw rook to c1, and then we saw bishop back to f7. And so we actually, Wesley so actually had a chance again uh, to, to shift back over uh, and get back behind the pawn. Uh, so rook to a1 would have pretty much set up a similar scenario that we saw before, um, but that's not what was played. Um, also, so after bishop coming to f7, we saw rook over to d1, uh, and we saw rook taking a3, uh, bishop down to d5. We saw h4, bishop taking f7, king taking f7, pawn taking h4, pawn taking h4. We got rook to d4. So we're laterally trying to attack this pawn over here. As you guys can see the position, um, there really isn't a way for either side to really press for a win. And it really kind of comes down uh, to the pawn's position. And you guys can see that we have, uh, you guys can see that we have uh, eight, uh, you know, H pawns. So we got H3, uh, Rook comes over to G4. We have King to F6. We got Rook down to G3. Uh, so this is uh, forcing the trade basically, uh, or to get checked forever. Um, so the rook takes on g3. We got pawn takes g3. And it really doesn't too much matter what you do. Uh, White's goal in this position uh, to make sure that they secure a draw uh, is to basically make sure that they kind of shift between these uh, two squares. Did I really just do that? Wow. Let me just fix this board. That's a first. Got it. <laughs> I literally messed the board up, like in the stream. All right, that's gonna be funny. That's gonna be one for the for the for the, for the, uh, the outtake reel. Uh, but anyway, um, so that's pretty much what you see in the position. Uh, king comes to g5. We see uh, king to h1, king to h5, king to g1, king to g5, king goes back to h1. We see king to h5, king to g1, king to g5, and it is a draw by threefold repetition. So backing up the game um, to the point that we had after g5, uh, I'm not really sure like what Wesley saw, like what, what his like what his calculation was, what he was actually thinking about in this position. Maybe he saw something different. Um, but uh, you know, I kind of just feel like, I mean, yeah, A4 is just like kind of screaming out, you know. A4 is like, hey, let's do that. Uh let's try to score a touchdown. Cause I mean, pretty much if black doesn't do what they need to do, you can pretty much just clear your bishop out of the way and just continuously push your pawn as far as possible uh and put black in a very, very defensive position. Um if we got to what we had before after A6. Like I said before, the bishop comes back, the bishop comes back, we got king here. The rook is gonna have to step over, you got a7. Uh, and then, I mean, if the king tries to go this way, you're gonna be coming this way, and then you're gonna be collecting these pawns. Uh, and this is just something that you just cannot possibly win as black. So um, I think, you know, Wesley, so he had a real chance right there um, to, to, you know, hook that game up uh, and it kind of just slipped through his fingers. So, I mean, happens to the best of us. I mean, nobody's perfect. But, uh, you know, it doesn't make you a little bit, you know, sad, like, hey, man, just just take that W, man. <laughs> but anyway, um, I appreciate you guys stopping by very much. Um, you know, merci beaucoup to all of my people that's, uh, that are French. Uh, and uh, so I got these other languages, and uh, I think I'm doing pretty good with them. Let me try to see what I can't roll off and do. See what my memory's looking like. All right, so I got uh, my Ayon Buntag, um, my Yad Na Agahan, uh, Nine Bag Na Bigat, Masantos Yakabosan. Uh, Marhe na aga, uh, buenas dias, um, uh, mapia na uma, uh, capian capa nu dios, um, what's the other ones, man? Um, I know I have mar, uh, ma anyong aga, um, maybe that wasn't right. Uh, Mayap uh, Abak, that was another one. Uh, Mayad Naaga, that was uh, the one I got. Uh, Kanareya, I think Kanareya. And then I, I got a new one, uh, Magwin Danao. Uh, Mapia uh, uh, Agai, I think that's how you say it. Mapia Agai. Yep. So uh, I'm still working on it. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> they're all brand new to me, so it's a little bit tough. So I mean, I'm 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 trying my best I can, you know, to get them and stuff like that. So when I get back rolling and everything. Uh, I think I'll have everything, uh, you know, set up and, and, and hooked up. So at one point, one day, I will literally get through every single one of them and be, you know, just like the back of my hand. So I appreciate you guys very much for stopping by and I'll see y'all next time.